to design human centered products and share them with the world. Um, and then of course, advocate, advocate. We love to work with you to help advance social change so young people can get the education and the care that they need and deserve. Um, so you, if you have more questions or you wanna learn more, you can reach out to us by going to healthyteennetwork.org backslash ask. As I mentioned yesterday, we would love to hear your feedback on the various sessions and the format that we use this year, since I know we did things a little differently than we've done in the past. So please complete the evaluation. Um, we're going to drop the link to it again in the chat right now, and we'll be sharing it out again throughout this session. Um, also, you can get to put yourself in the running for some great prizes. So we would really love to hear your feedback. Thank you. I'm just looking at a couple of the things that have come in. Thank you all for sharing these learnings with us. And with that, um, I'm thrilled to open this session today and to reintroduce Dr. Tanya Bass, Vanessa Giffard, and Stuart Getty, who are opening speakers from yesterday. They are back to each share their five tips on how we can start expanding our understanding and practice of inclusivity today. What are some things that we can start to implement now? Um, after they do that, they will be here on the screen with me um, so that they can answer some of the questions. Some of you submitted questions between yesterday and today, and we have those. And then of course, any questions that you drop into the chat during the session or while we're talking. And now I'm going to turn things over. We're going to start with Tanya again, and then Vanessa, and then Stuart, and then we'll all be back on for questions. Well, I am back and I want to continue our conversation to talking about leveling up. How can you level up to provide culturally relevant sexuality education? And this is a topic that's near and dear to me because this is where I focus some of my most recent research. And I know it seems like, how do I do it? And I have um, some of the answers for you. The biggest answer that I can give to you is to acknowledge what you don't know. Sexuality educators have to be able to cultivate their dispositional humility. So first you have to acknowledge what it is that you don't know. And then in doing so, you can conduct a self-assessment to examine your dispositional humility and your cultural consciousness. So there are plenty of assessments out there, but one of the most um, useful assessments that I know of is the Professional Learning Standards for Sexuality Education. There are about four domains on this assessment, and one of them is really about your disposition. The other domains look at content and what needs to be taught and is aligned with the National Standards for Sexuality Education. Now, cultivating your professional disposition or dispositional humility overall is probably a new concept for you. Let me explain to you what dispositional, dispositional humility is. Dispositional humility is the ability that you have to accurately assess yourself. And that allows you to recognize that even though your individual skill and will, your capacity, your educational attainment, you know, all those degrees that you have or learnings that you've attained throughout the time of your career, are not enough for you to adequately be successful. It's basically acknowledging, you know what? I know a lot, I've learned a lot, but I have room for growth. If you have a fair level, a, a good level of dispositional humility, then that is gonna allow you to continue to want to be able to do things better or maybe even do things differently. It's how you go to a conference sometimes or a webinar. If you ever have that feeling of, oh, I've already gone to a consent workshop. That's not having a good dispositional humility. A good dispositional humility says, hey, I've been to a few consent workshops. I wonder how this is gonna be different. 
And I wonder what new takeaways I can use in teaching about consent. That's how you want to approach your work as a sexuality educator. That's how you can be culturally responsive because then you'll be open to more learning and to growing. So the second thing that I wanna share is to participate in the professional development. So if you have this level of disposition and humility of understanding, I don't know it all and I can learn more, that's gonna tap into your desire to participate in professional development that is gonna be meaningful and useful for you as a sexuality educator. This is where your commitment comes in. You want to be able to commit to learn more and expand your worldview. Remember I was talking about the sexual attitude re um, reassessment or the SAR training? You could commit to participating in a SAR as your agency allows or your finances allow. And the real cool thing about professional development right now are people are being very generous and flexible on how to pay for those opportunities. And some people are even offering those opportunities for free. And then finally, as you're continuing to grow, you can apply an equity and inclusive lens in your teaching and center those who are most marginalized. That's what culturally responsive sexuality education is. You're attuned not only to yourself, but to the individuals and the communities that you're reaching through your education. I think if you get those things down, conduct an assessment, participate in professional development, and utilize an equity and inclusive lens, you'll be most effective at your role as a sexuality educator. Thank you again for your time. And you can reach me on the gram or here's my website. Um, you can email me as well. And I'm really grateful to be sharing some space and time with you on today. Thanks. So as we wrap up the conference, welcome back again. And here we are gonna be talking about our five ways to not be a white savior in sex ed. So first things first, the thing that we have to ask ourselves is what is my motivation? Why am I doing this work? And essentially, if we are doing this work because you know we pity the communities that we're in, we you know want to swoop in and do something significant and have this grand emotional experience in this work, that is not good enough. So we need to take our time to understand what our motivations are, why are we doing this work, what keeps us going, and what are we gaining from doing this work? Number two, are you the only expert in the room or are you willing to learn from your students? The number one thing that I've learned in my time as a sex educator is that there is something to always learn from our students. They may not always have the technical knowledge of what we're discussing, but they have experiences, they've heard of things, they have stories that they are bringing and they are bringing their expertise into the classroom. And we really have to ask ourselves, are we honoring that? Or do we see ourselves as the only expert in the room and the only person that can share something valuable in the room? Number three, what assumptions have you made about your students? Again, do you see them as pity cases that you're walking in to save? What are your motivations for doing this? Are your assumptions and biases showing up? What are they? Have you taken time to explore them? And how are you finding the time to dismantle them? And what things are you doing to dismantle these assumptions and biases that we're all walking into our classrooms with? Number four, have you consulted the community? So you've walked in, what are the strength points of the community? Where do people already access sexual health information? Where are the other youth groups? Where are the other groups and stakeholders in the community that can tell you and share and educate you about what's been going on, what other interventions have been happening, what's been successful and what hasn't? Who do you need to partner with? Who are the stakeholders that, that you need to build relationship with? in order to make this time that you have in the community impactful and making sure that you're making this impactful and inclusive for the students that you're working with and the communities you're working with. And then number five, you've got to become a life-affirming sex educator. 
And so I have an intensive training that you can join to learn how to do these things. And so a lot of what we discuss is just a microcosm. It is just a little bit about how to not be a white savior. But essentially, when we are becoming a life affirming sex educator, we are essentially finding strategies and we are learning how to engage engage and honor the whole student? How do we understand the impacts and the history, the racist history of sex education in our country? How do we honor our students? How do we make sure we answer questions and show up in a way that honors the entire student and provides, and provides a partnership rather than you just being an expert in the classroom? So I want you to join me. I want you to sign up. And uh, I want you to learn more about our training. Um, and it is a self-paced online uh, intensive where we essentially break down this concept of being a white savior and move towards the competencies to being a life-affirming sex educator. Let's talk and let's learn more from each other. You can find me uh, at Vanessa Jeff at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram at Vagisteam, and you can also find me on LinkedIn. I look forward to connecting with you all. I look forward to seeing you at the intensive, and I'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back. I'm Stuart Getty again, and I'm here with the top five things that you can do right now to make your communities, your classrooms more inclusive, especially of those that use non-binary pronouns and are experiencing gender expression beyond the norm. So top five things. Number one, make pronoun sheets and pass them around the first day. I say pronoun sheets because after talking to a bunch of kids and a lot of teachers, finding out that Sometimes pronoun circles of going around and asking folks in classrooms, what's your name, what's your pronoun, can cause a lot of anxiety for different reasons. Because sometimes people are, are not ready to have that conversation. Sometimes they feel like they're not passing enough when you have to ask them their pronoun. So a really great tip is send out sheets that people can fill out and give back to you. And I made one myself and you can make your own and there are actually some on the internet because other teachers are doing this as well. But some things you can ask are like student's name, pronouns. Do you want me to use this, these pronouns in class? Yes, no, let's talk later. With your family, yes, no, let's talk. Who are the members of your family? And I've seen one that asked all about the holidays that you celebrate. You can throw that in there too, to be more inclusive about different religions and different things that might bring students out of the classroom for holidays and such. Um, so, yeah, how to do pronouns better. Kids may still be in the process of figuring things out. So don't just ask what's your pronoun in front of folks. I think I just said that with the pronoun sheets. Um, but be aware that not everything is safe for kids. Bullying is still a thing. Pronoun circles may also not work for shy folks. You can op op also, you can also optionally share pronouns when exchanging names or using name tags. That gets a little risky if people aren't ready to go there yet. So my, my tip is to make a pronoun sheet and pass it around and have them fill it out and send it back to you without anyone else having to see it. Okay, number two, throw out binary language like ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and even he, she. Now this might mean changing some worksheets from he, she to they, but you should try it. Um, some other words that you can try instead are ladies and gentlemen, instead of ladies and gentlemen, people, peeps, friends, folks, everyone, y'all, you all, fam, boy, from, instead of boys and girls, kids, kiddos, children, friends, angels, rock stars. I'm not kidding. Sir or ma'am, you could say you, friend, gentle person. I'm kidding a little bit about gentle person, but you know, these ways of speaking, it removes gender, which also removes assumptions. Like I said, don't judge a book by a cover. Number three, have the rough combos so kids don't have to. What do I mean by that? Well, kids shouldn't be on the front lines of fighting for a more inclusive world. Sadly, a lot of times they are. Um, like if you look at the school district in Alabama, or no, Arkansas earlier this year, 
they were the ones that were testifying. There were a lot of teachers and nurses who also did, and that's what I'm talking about. Be an ally, use your voice. Adults should be protecting kids. Adults should be having these hard conversations and going into spaces and making it safer for the kids. Shouldn't be the other way around. Number four, bathrooms can mean safety. So I said that this isn't all about bathrooms and pronouns, but in some ways it can be about bathrooms and pronouns. Specifically in schools, I have heard stories, really sad stories of kids that are genderqueer who won't go to bathroom all day. They will run home from school at the end of the day and they haven't used the restroom all day because of that moment of having to choose boy or girl. So either fight for gender neutral bathrooms, which is usually like one hole or small rooms, um, or try to make it safe for people to use the restroom, either having supervised restroom moments or letting them go in the middle of the class. So it's not a, a really rush time. So there's less folks in there, but you really don't know how privileged you are if you've never had to think about where you have to pee. As someone who hates going to rest stops and gas stations on road trips, because I often get people to tell me you're in the wrong room, even though I kind of am, unless it's a one holer, in which case I'm like, why are you in this small room with me? Okay, number five, do the research. What do I mean by that? Well, listening to things like that, you're on your way, but also Google stuff. There are so many resources on the internet these days. Triple W has got your back, I swear. So I threw in some how to be a good ally to trans students or how to be a good ally to non-binary students or students or students who use they like just do a little resource finding on your own so that when you come into a classroom or you come into a community moment you are so informed and you're so ready to create safety for these types of kids because they deserve it too they're worth it or <laughs> you could buy my book that's also a resource that's why I made it for folks like you to learn. I'm kind of kidding, but I'm kind of not. So there you go. Those are my top five. Thanks so much. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you again um, for those great five tips from each of you, things we can do now. We're going to turn things over to a Q&A with our three presenters. So we're going to bring them back onto the screen and just as soon as we can get everybody back on screen, we will start with the questions. Um, I have the questions that have already been submitted through the form that we were using yesterday and earlier today. Um, please go ahead and type any other questions that you have in the chat. Um, and I will ask um, Tanya Stewart and Vanessa to turn their cameras and their mics on and join me on this beautiful screen right now. That would be great. Let's see. We can just... Great. Hi, friends. Great to see everybody. Um, so we got a number of questions that came in yesterday. Um, and one of the first ones that came up, um, um, Tanya, I'm going to start with you, um, said, how in, um, in the sex ed world, particularly with evidence-based interventions, where you are literally sometimes reading from a script, how do we move beyond just that script and be more inclusive and addressing some of the intersectionality that we know is so important to do? What suggestions do you have in that situation? 
Yeah, that is an amazing question that I often address um, in doing like trainer or facilitators with some of the Ebbies. And as I think about it, it was like, first of all, fidelity does not mean reading the script, everyone. If you're using a, a curriculum that says that, I'm almost positive it's not one of the approved ones. Fidelity means following the script so that you can become comfortable with the information and the knowledge to facilitate the discussion and facilitate the workshops or sessions, modules, whatever you call them um, in the curricula. So the first thing is to like become one in a sense with your curriculum, but that as you do that, you get to find those gaps. So I won't name a curricula that we use here in North Carolina that I've trained folks just last week, but we talked about you know the fact that while this has been proven as um, uh, effective a few years ago we still know the content and the context is still relevant but the wording and the language and even some of the um, as Stuart was talking um, about language is that we went line by line on this curriculum to change the language to ensure that it was inclusive that we looked at gendered language we looked at things that might have been culturally um, inappropriate, for lack of a better word, that was um, culturally insensitive and stigmatizing. And we went through and we offered language and changes so that our facilitators will understand that as they're growing and learning this curricula or curriculum at that point, they're able to make it their own. And then the second thing is you get to infuse things. So like, as long as you're following the curriculum, you're, you, you're doing model fidelity. If questions or information come up, it's your responsibility to be prepared. So coming to Healthy Teen Network Conference, doing a SAR, um, buying Stewart's book, like all the things like reading, it, it requires you to actually do something. It's not gonna magically fall down. And so the more that you engage and you learn and you have conversations with other people doing similar work, now that you've become one with this curriculum, you can see kind of some of the, the areas that need more attention. Or as you're facilitating and students have questions, you'll be more comfortable and capable of responding to them and allowing, um, I know a lot of people do co-facilitation, allowing a level of accountability between co-facilitators or other staff to ensure that if there's some glaring issues that you can change that. So my last and final thing is to say, reading verbatim does not equate to fidelity. I promise you, become comfortable. Even one of the things I do, last thing seriously this time, is talk to yourself in a mirror. Take your curriculum and like pretend you're facilitating to yourself. That increases your comfort so that you don't have to read it verbatim because that's just not fidelity. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Vanessa here adding to Tanya. We needed that. Thank you. I think sometimes people just need to, to hear it. Absolutely. Um, Vanessa, I'm going to bring the next question to you. Um, somebody wrote in, uh, Vanessa, you mentioned the empower the idea of empowering people rather than doing things for or to them. What could empowerment look or sound like in an educational setting? Thank you so much for this question. So on the surface, when I think about empowering our students or if we're thinking about an educational setting, the first thing that comes to mind is actually getting people up to do activities and getting students to critically think. Like Tanya said for so long, when we are doing sex ed curricula, I find that teachers are so scared to engage in conversation. They think it's literally a one way or it's a lecture. And just to even simplify or even um, make the activities more inclusive and get people getting up and get people like actually applying the concepts, I feel like folks have a lot of anxiety because they're like, well, what if they say something I'm not prepared for? I feel like sex ed and teaching sex ed is the biggest stand up comedy show of our lives um, because you just do not know what's going to happen. You can have hecklers, you can have people that are preaching back at you in the audience, you can have people who are laughing with you, you can have people having fun with you. And so I essentially am saying all that to say that we don't know what we are going to get in the classroom and we can breathe through that. And we have to know that all of us are here for a reason, we are competent. We are people talking to other people. So if a conversation is going someplace that you may not be like abiding by the book um, prepared for, 
you can handle it. You have the skills to yes. This is just having a conversation with folks. And so I like to say in the simplest form, get people moving, have folks participate in doing the condom demo if you're able to. So I bought a bunch of wooden penis models for my classroom. So I don't have one for everybody, but I have enough for folks to like pair up and you know, share. And if, you know, if we have school district policies or we have individual school policies that don't allow you to do this, I at least can hand out a condom to everybody so that they can follow along with me to a certain extent and have them feel and actually do the things that, you know, follow me and ask questions along the way, because doing it in real life is totally different than doing it in the classroom or just watching that one teacher that you had in eighth grade and you never <laughs> But again, do it again. So those tangible skills, the getting people up, we can do debates. I like to do civil debates in our classroom. So if we're talking about healthy relationships, all right, y'all, we're going to talk about healthy relationships. For the folks who agree with the statement, I want you to move over to this side. For the folks who disagree, stand over here. And then I'm going to pick a couple of people to talk about their viewpoints. And that is the way that one, they're applying the concepts, but two, they're actually participating. Three, no one's going to be sleeping. Okay. And then, <laughs> so again, it's the way that, you know, I feel that is empowering our students and our folks to create their own voice, hear what's actually happening and actually apply and utilize some of the concepts that you're either, either learning or, and it also gives you an opportunity to learn what conversations have been happening in this class or in this community or in this environment before you walked in and it, it gives you an opportunity to have an exchange as well. And so critical thinking, I think, is a skill that a lot of our um, sex ed curricula does not, uh, does not incorporate. And I think the biggest way, uh, the biggest example of this, for instance, is like consent curriculum. So with consent curriculum, we tell people like, get a yes, make sure that they're not saying no. Okay, and ask for consent. But when we think about the nuance of language and the culture and how people's faces shift, and if we're actually talking about real nuanced communication in our culture, just learning those basics is not going to help you. But can we do engage in a role play where we are, you know, walking through some steps? What about this role play that I'm reading out to you? Where, where can we get consent? Well, where could they have gotten consent? Tell me how you get consent according to the way you speak. Because some people like to say, do you want to have the sex? And then some people like to say, what's up with it? You free Friday night, what's up with it? What you, what, what are you trying to do? Some of us are a little bit more smooth with it. But it doesn't look like that textbook definition of this is consent and this is how you get consent. And so part of the empowerment piece is the practice piece. It's getting people speaking, getting people, yes, Kevin, that Netflix and chill, okay? Or like a group of my seventh graders said this summer, um, I think they said it was um, Disney plus and thrust. Hey, the kids are clever. The kids are clever. Um, so, <laughs> so essentially I say all that to say empowerment to me looks like helping apply the concepts but also getting folks actually interacting in a, in a classroom and in an educational setting. Great, thank you. I just, before we go to the next question that I have, I was just gonna open it to Tanya or to Stuart to see if they had anything to add around the empowerment piece from your perspective and the work that you're doing, what else can we be doing to be empowering and not doing four or two? I know one of the things I do, um, especially with youth and young adults, is to try, they get to create their learning or the learning for each other. Um, one of the projects, um, and actually I think they opened up a, a HTN a few years ago um, called AMP, um, where we had like performing theater-based sexuality education. And in that process, our students get to talk about, you know, I, I allow them to pick five topics that they think their peers will want to learn about um, that's relevant to what we're teaching in class and then they pick a, a way to provide that information whether it's a television uh, or a movie trailer or you know shopping at a store and we came up with a few years ago the last one was um they came up with intimacy mark they felt like the so they took the ownership of learning and teaching and they felt like um their peers 
um, needed to learn more about intimacy and what that looks like. And they pretended that they were going through a store called the Intimacy Mart and talking about love taps and massages and reading and hugs and holding hands and really amplifying what intimacy means and how you can have meaningful relationship with intimacy that doesn't involve any type of penetrative or um sex act that um you know you might not even be ready for you're just trying to get to know that person and i love that type of engagement i feel like that's empowering one for the students to build it and um, be able to share it and, and, and use it as a tool for their peers. But then too, when their peers actually see it and learn from it, that's a level of empowerment too, because they get to see that um, they could do this themselves or have a better understanding of it. Thank you. And Stuart, I know I'm just also gonna add, um, so I was reading Stuart's book again last night because I was having my seventh grader read it. So I was just like rereading some sections before I passed it off. Um, and I do highly recommend it. Um, one of the lines in there that really stuck with me says, kids are born fluid. It's our world that boxes them in. So I was also just thinking about, right, how <laughs> it is really, that's going to be a line that sticks with me for a very long time and will infuse into the work that we're doing at this organization, and I hope with all of you as well. And just as you're thinking about what are we doing to, in, from the empowerment standpoint, how do we empower them not to let themselves be boxed in by this world that we've created. I feels as though, again, I have a seventh grader and they are very, their minds are very open right now. And they, it's like suddenly they're open and looking at all the options that can be and how do we help them to continue down that pathway without starting to feel boxed in in our culture? Mm. I mean, just you You're asking. <laughs> yeah, boom, let's solve it. Um, I mean, you just asking that question is like that first lily pad that gets you to that's the that's the sort of thinking that you're trying to create in the classrooms and the communities is people actually being like, well, how can I create this freedom and this like space for people to figure out on their own what's right for them. And that's what that was what I was going to add to like how do you empower for the kids is well you practice for yourself you get yourself really right on on what you know, but you create containers for them to practice, for them to experience, and for them to own, I mean, I'm just plus oneing on what they've already said, but for them to own the content and the making, because kids can sniff out inauthentic inauthenticity in a heartbeat, and us, like, I've heard us called, like, crusties, um, dusties, like, old people, um, especially if we're trying to get on TikTok, uh, <laughs> yeah, really, for real, um, and so I think that like having them make the content, you know, I think that um, working with Gen Z is like, you actually just collaborate with them and you go, here are the tools, here's the container. And like, I want you to make the campaign or I want you to make the language for it. Um, Cause the kids are so free and it really is our society and adults and our constraints that we put on stuff that really hold, hold that freedom back. So I think, yeah. I think you asking that question is is the right direction, but how can we just continue to ask that question in every space that we create? Thank you. Um, thank you all for, for that. Um, I'm gonna ask um, just a specific question came in, Stuart. I'd love you to respond to it. Someone said, um, how do you address someone who says they have no pronouns or says they use all pronouns? So the person wrote in, to me, no pronouns mean they would like to just be called by their name all the time. So Mary goes to the store, Mary reads a book, Mary went to a conference. Um, is that correct? It, is that what no pronouns means? Also, what about all pronouns? Does that mean that I can just choose to whatever pronoun I want to use with that person? How do I know? Um, it's a great question. I think that we're seeing more and more um, folks having more fluidity, like a she slash they, or no pron pronouns or any pronoun with good intentions. I've heard like all of these used in circles. To me, no pronouns does mean that if you can avoid using pronouns, use the name. Um, and all pronouns also means maybe you rotate between all of the pronouns that you know, um, and each time you refer to them differently. I would also say ask, you know, like um, I think, there's more opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one conversation and dialogue that will get you further with the trust and relationship that you're creating with um, someone who uses different 
pronouns so they see you as a safe person who's like hey it's just you and me no one's around I just wanted to make sure does no pronouns mean Mary 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 and if they're like actually can you use M like which I've also heard like people use their like uh, initial for their first name as their their pronoun people are doing all sorts of stuff so I would encourage that to be the beginning of a conversation not like okay I've got it you said no pronouns got it okay no pronouns or all pronouns and I would encourage you to take that extra step and start asking Mary like how would you prefer for me to to be referring to you but yeah so I'm only one person yeah, I'm only one person, so I can't speak for Mary or the all pronouns person, but I do, I do understand that this can be, you know, tender topics and you don't, you want to tread lightly, but having one-on-one -on -one conversations about this stuff, I think is a really good idea, especially for educators. Vanessa, were you raising your hand to, to add something? You're just moving. Okay, cool. Um, so another question came in, um, and this one was for everybody. Um, it said, in terms of anti-racism, sex positive, gender affirming, sexual and reproductive work, what do you think can be done to shift the framework of the grants that fund most of what we do? Oftentimes the funding dictates the work instead of the other way around. How can we as workers in the field shift and move the funding into a new direction? Um, Dr. Tanya, I'm gonna start it with you. And then we can yeah. move around. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure uh, um, as a collective even um, yet how we can shift the funding. But I think what I've learned to do and become pretty good at is allowing myself to apply for things that just um, I'm able to maneuver and leverage the funding. Um, it'd be great if the funding would support that. But if you're doing... Um, comprehensive sex ed and you're not addressing racism, implicit bias, uh, intersectionality, if you're not um, affirming, if you're not inclusive, then you're really not doing that work. And so therefore the funding should match. Like, so even if you're doing, let's say you're getting funding to do said specific EBI, for example, we were just talking about, your work and your approach to that program should be inclusive, should be anti-racist, should be affirming, because that's the type of organization, I hope, the values that you have within your organization. And honestly, there's nothing you can't do. Like I have yet, I've been on several grants and several fund, federally and state funded positions where there was never a not to do. There was always the to do. And so if it's not not to do, guess what? I'm gonna do it if it's appropriate and effective and scientifically based, medically accurate, culturally appropriate, because that's what that's the type of educator or prof professional I need to be. But to that point, we do probably need to politicize and, and strategize ways to show that these are some of the things that we're doing outside of what your grant requires. Are you able to fund this? Or is there any opportunity to give us even more funding to do it? Because sometimes those little extras they come at a cost. We may not pay for them with an organizational budget, but somebody's digging in the pocket. Somebody's doing a little bit extra sometimes to ensure that people are um, um, having access to the appropriate education. So I just say, let's focus on what we can do within the parameters versus um, about, I think we need that movement, don't get me wrong, but like don't allow what's written on a paper as your deliverables to hold you only to those deliverables. You can go beyond those deliverables. Great, thank you. Stuart or Vanessa, any thoughts on what we can do with the funding situations that we're in? How to expand them? Oh, but, so in my screen, Stuart's down, so like this, okay. <laughs> Stuart's like, oh. <laughs> um so this one this one's a tricky one and I know that funding was like an essential part like one of the the big tiers of my uh presentation but I'm also very realistic in that these systems are not going to change like god willing we are all working uh to change them but capitalism racism like this stuff has been here before us and 
we're working like hell to like make sure that we don't have it in the future for you know the new generations to come but we know that these systems are very rigid and they're going to be here and so the way that i get around it and the way that i try and like try like you know fight my fight is when we are applying for grants i try and like put in all of that language that i was talking about in my presentation so i i go the extra paragraph and i say like these communities that have been historically forgotten due to do 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 are you paying are they paying attention maybe not um but i'm going to make sure that i'm not i'm not laying into the words that you're looking for like underserved or you know all of the all of the feel good funder words that they're that they're looking for I also feel like if you have to use those words, listen, we, like Tanya said, like you have to just do what you gotta do at times and think about the end result and what you can do and what you're going to do with that money versus, you know, I'm gonna sometimes always stand, sometimes standing in the gap or fighting a good fight is not always the move because we know that we have to eat. We know we have organizations to support. We know we have we have organ we have communities to reach and if we a lot of us if we don't have this money we're not going to be able to do the effective work that we can do or use that money to fund our salaries do the intervention but yet we're able to do all these other cool things and have great after school programs or provide lunches or what whatever and so i my mantra in my work is i love using rich white people money to do the work that i have to do if that gets me the visibility if that gets me where we need to go, if that lets me be creative within the confines, you know, then fine. Like I could hit the deliverables and then I could do 20 million other things that I know is going to be more effective and speaks to, you know, the populations uh, that I'm serving. And I know I'm right there in the fight with y'all, like my positions, my educators positions, they're all grant funded. And so we know that this is a reality it's a reality that we need to shift and in more of these conferences, we need to have more funders coming to the table to have these conversations because unfortunately, the funders, we know who they are. A lot of them come from a specific group. They look like only specific people um, and they fund very specific things and they want to hear very specific things. And there is a whole realm of issues and problems in the uh, philanthropy world around white saviorism and you know how they just want ego stroke and how they only want certain amounts of data, but you got, you have really good, you know, qualitative data <laughs> and you know, that's not what they want to see. They just want to see check marks. They want to see certain things. And so there's a whole movement that needs to happen on that side. And they need to come over here and hear some of these conversations that we're having. And they need to understand how they are playing a problem and a persistent problem. Because for us to even be thinking about applying for grants from year to year to year, submitting reports every six months, like it is ridiculous, but they don't know that, right? They don't, they don't know that because they're not having these conversations. They're in their bubble doing their thing and they're not really on the ground. They're just here to shell out the money, which, which yes, we are grateful for, but there is a whole impactful change that needs to happen in the, in the fundraising world and the grants world. Um, and that goes from the feds all the way down to the private funders that, fu that, that fund our program. So we have a lot of work to do, but do what you have to do to get the work that you need to get done. Rub those, you know, shake those hands, rub those elbows, do whatever, whatever they say out there. And, um, you know, do what you gotta do to get the money to, to do that impactful work. Thank you, Vanessa. You were getting a lot of uh, pre-chits, all right. Great insight, Vanessa and Tanya, thank you. Um, Stuart, not meaning to leave you as a plus and one, wanting them again, but do just want to give you the opportunity if there's anything else that you'd like to add or share from some of the work that you've done or thoughts that you have. I mean, I don't think I could say it any better than they've just said it. Like both of them are so amazing and being on this panel is just, I'm feeling blessed. So thanks for letting me be here with you all. One thing I would just say, and you guys have already sort of touched on it, is just like, um, if you build it, they will come. And if you're going after this money and you're putting that language in there and you're just continuously stressing, I'm working on an uh, equitable curation of charitable giving project right now with Gates Foundation. And I just will not get off the fact that if we're talking about wealth and equity, 
we have to be talking about land back and we have to be talking about reparations just at the heart of what we're doing. And it's making everyone feel really uncomfortable, but it also, yeah, I mean, that's what we're, what we're here to do. And I think it begets more change to just keep talking and holding that vision of the change that you want to create. You just keep, keep talking about it. You keep, yeah, rubbing elbows, shaking hands, taking that money, but also being really clear about why you're taking that money and what your vision is for what you're going to create with it. Um, but yeah, just in awe of both of your answers, because I feel like y'all really, really handled it. <laughs> but I want to add, I think Stuart has a really good point, And I want to speak to something else, though, is that we each of us use whatever privilege that we have. And so I really appreciate Stuart using their privilege to essentially be like, all right, guess what we're doing? We're going to get this money, but I'm going to keep, you know, I'm going to keep jumping down your throat. Just like I expect the, you know, white grant writers at my organizations to jump in front and speak to their folks and essentially finesse what we have to finesse in order to do the program. So wherever we have privilege or wherever we have a platform to speak um, to dismantle some of these things, then we definitely need to jump in front and use that. Like, again, whatever it takes <laughs> um, to essentially yeah. speak that language. Thank really you for, for adding that, absolutely. And I did just wanna give everyone um, who's here watching right now, if you have an additional question, that you did want to have answered, please pop it into the chat, either directly to, to any of the hosts um, or to the whole group. I want to make sure that I get to as many as I can um, in our last few minutes. So if you have anything else that came up that you want to make sure you get that you add or follow up on, um, please put that in the chat now. Um, so building on uh, what you just said, Tony, another question came in and it says, um, Dr. Bass, in your opening session, you brought up the importance of starting the dialogue of culturally relevant sexuality education with peers and colleagues and how hard or potentially uncomfortable this may be. Do you have tips on how to start these conversations with coworkers? And I think probably Vanessa and Stuart can, can add to that as well, because I think in all of your talks, how do we approach some of this with our coworkers and our colleagues? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the first thing I would say, you know, so, uh, in some of the conversations, I jokingly say, like, read a book. But no, for real, read a book, ultimately, um, as you approach this. But when I think about how to start the conversation, the one thing you don't do is expect um, um, marginalized individuals to do the emotional labor and the teaching for you. That's why I jokingly say read a book, because you have to do some of that learning on your own. But it does take time. It does take vulnerability. It does take grace. Um, it takes a little bit of patience. It takes making mistakes. Um, it takes humility and it takes um, accountability. And so just asking with curiosity, I think that's that humility that we we're talking about like cultural humility, humility, like really, why are you asking questions? What are your intentions behind um, what you're asking and how you're trying to be informed. So if you're really seeking to be culturally relevant, and I don't mean, because people think culturally relevant means on putting on a vernacular of a certain group, or, you know, like if you're in front of, I don't know, I always think about like, sometimes I have conversations with um, people as a black woman, and it's all of a sudden, I feel like they try to throw a black girl on me. And I'm like, I'm what you know like it's this this performative thing that's not being culturally relevant like being culturally relevant is speaking to the experience of those individuals so that's why reading a book having conversations with people going to trainings um and even getting feedback one of the things I really appreciate and have seen far too little of is individuals, whether it's a classroom setting or even with curricula, you know, they're not evaluating themselves. No one is really getting a self-evaluation from their participants or students and then looking at them and not looking at them from the point of like, I'm being judged, they don't like me, but really valuing the feedback and seeing as a gift that it is to help them become more culturally relevant and asking questions about, do you feel connected to this lesson? Do you feel um, like, you know, I'm presenting in a genuine way, like the, the opportunity to grow and have uh, and build that cultural responsive uh, education is through getting feedback from your peers, 
um, your, your colleagues, but most importantly, the students or the participants who, that you're working with. So to start the conversation is just start it, figure writing down what it is that you want and being vulnerable to say, listen, I really want to do better in X, Y, Z. I'm not asking you to help me, but I'd like to present or may I have a conversation with you about it and, and honor that person's response in time and don't stop there, if that makes sense. But yeah, read a couple of books. Stuart, I'm gonna turn things over to you. You can plug your book. It's one of those books to read. <laughs> it's so uncomfortable, but yes, buy my book. <laughs> buy my book, everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I even go so far as like Google stuff, y'all. Like, I mean, that was part of my, one of my tips was like, you, you need to, if you are finding that, you know, your peers and colleagues aren't to a place, you can say, hey, like, here are some some resources on the web that you can check out and here you know if you want to compile links for them or you can tell them to google stuff um i i've also found in my um i work at a design consultancy for my day job and i will tell you that we have we have a lot of hard and uncomfortable conversations but we create really intentional containers for those those conversations where we you know close the room and don't let anyone in who's not going to follow the agreements we create the agreements as a collective together i usually seed a few that's like don't talk over each other you know um assume positive intent um and like share the space be present be here don't be like half on your phone whatever um but make sure that people are down to be into the, in this conversation because they've then given consent for you to be like all right i'm holding you to this and we're having this conversation and i will plus one on feedback and just creating feedback feedback is a gift calling people in is actually saying i want you to be in my life but this thing that you did is not what i'm i'm wanting around me um especially like getting misgendered or people that are like putting out you know i'm working on a transitional phase for an insurance company. I want to talk to a trans person about transitions. And that's, you know, the trans folks at the organization have to be like, um, so this is why that didn't land well. And this is why, no, you don't get access to my community like that. Um, and so I think it's just, yeah, creating the space for dialogue and also, also plus one to like the curiosity and the humility that it takes when you come into a conversation to be like, I'm really curious about how you think about things. Um, and not just like making assumptions because you're also asking for assumptions not to be made. So it's good to model that, but yeah. Thank you, That's Vanessa, me. you have our, our closing remark. So I think about this in professional settings with like educators, for instance, and that's because that's the world that I know the most. And so, when I think about this question, I think about the kind of department slash ground rules slash community rules we establish. And the thing that I always tell educators, whether I'm training them or hiring them, is that one of the things that you have to become comfortable with is giving and receiving feedback. And so you start off with doing that, you know, whether that's in the training or after we're done, like something that I do, you know, in my day job with my colleagues is after we're done teaching, all right let me tell you what you did well okay and when you said that mm -mm. and we all know because we've established this relationship and these ground rules that it's not coming from a place of I hate you or from a negative place it's coming from a place of I want to see you get better I saw something or I saw a blind spot that you potentially had and I want to make sure that you know you you are your best because you represent all of us in this community and so I think that when it comes to to having these difficult conversations that's key and so when we are having whether that's our weekly check-ins or right after class check-ins and we say like hey when you were teaching the other day you said this thing and i could tell i don't know if you know this but in the class uh it kind of it kind of shifted the mood it kind of shifted the energy or i did you notice the kid in the corner that was cowering you know, here's how you could have said it. You know what, let's kind of, let's practice this. Or you could admit like something felt weird when you taught that thing the other day. I don't, I'm not sure what it is, but I know this an energy shift. Maybe we should look into this together or maybe we can tap 
so and so or get Stewart's book or you know whatever go on the healthy teen network website like and look up how do we go about doing x y and z and so like Stuart said feedback is a gift it is an ultimate gift of care because guess what when we don't give each other feedback that means I'm gonna just let Stuart go out there and just act the fool, just look crazy. Mm -mm, like, mm -mm, can't even, you know what? Mm -mm. I'm gonna let them be embarrassed. But when I really care about you, I'm actually saying I'm investing my time and my energy to have a conversation with you. And I'm committed to improving us and finding the tools and resources where we can both improve. And so I think establishing that, or if that's not already within your culture, I think that start it. You know, hey, you know what? I want to be a better educator and I want to be better at X, Y, and Z. I want to hear feedback from you. And so once you, once people start giving feedback to you, it's only right. And a lot of times they'll say, well, I want to hear, I want to hear from you too. Or like, that sounds like a great idea. And so now we are engaging in this feedback loop with each other. So that's what comes to mind when I hear, when I hear this. Thank you. Well, I could sit here all day and talk to the three of you, but I do know we, we need to wrap it up. So I just wanna say thank you so much, Vanessa, Dr. Tanya, Stuart. If you we were in person, you would hear everybody clapping for you. I hope you're seeing what they're saying in the chat. Thank you all so much for joining us again today. Thank you for all you did to prepare your presentations for yesterday and then being able to be here live for this Q&A portion. Thank you really so much. Appreciate all of you. Um, and now I just, as we wrap things up, um, I'm starting to reflect back on these past few days and thinking about a common thread to so many of the sessions, whether we are talking about intersectionality or systemic racism or anti-fat bias or moving beyond teen pregnancy prevention, it's more than just language or framing. And at Healthy Teen Network, we often talk a lot about how much words matter and while of course that, that is true, words do matter and they matter a lot, it's also much bigger than that. It's our mindset and it's being aware of how our experiences, our values, our biases can color our perspective. As educators and professionals who work with youth, it's our responsibility to move past all of that by interrogating what social constructs about race, gender, or body size we have internalized. We must also consider all the experiences, values, and more that young people bring with them all the time, every day. And this is how we can be more inclusive and affirming so that we can meet the needs of all young people. This is how we can go about dismantling biases that uphold systems of inequality, oppression, and discrimination that keep our clients, students, and patients from getting the support they need. And it's not just about how we see things, but how we do things. Many of our sessions over yesterday and today encouraged us to open our eyes to new ways of doing things, whether it's committing the time and energy to develop and maintain a brand because it can build connection and trust with our audience, or think about how we can leverage existing tools and technology to change up what's always been done, like being able to order a sexual assault collection kit through DoorDash. How amazing was that idea? Or listening to and uplifting the experiences of the end user or the community where a program or solution will be implemented. Starting there with them as the experts on their challenges to innovate and create something that truly solves problems. When we stop doing things the same way they've always been done and give ourselves the space and freedom, everyone benefits. One of the ways that we can do all this to level up, as Dr. Tanya encouraged us to do, to brighten, to broaden our mindsets for the intersectional world that we live in, is by following the advice we heard from Andrea yesterday, to invest our time in making connections all the time, not just when or because we need something from someone. These, connect, these connections, this networking, this is not just about who we know, but also who knows us and knows what we're doing. As we close this year's conference, I encourage you, as I know I'll be doing, to think about what fills your cup. Take the time to notice what are some things in our jobs, in our daily lives that bring us joy? And is there a balance or an imbalance in what drains our cups? 
And then what are some action steps? How can we begin to move ourselves through the stages of change to reset that balance? And I ask that not just because it's important for ourselves, even though it is, and it, we know critically it is, but also because that is how we are able to show up for young people. Thank you so much for joining me these past few days, for joining our whole organization with each other, um, and for all the work that you are doing each and every day. We see you and we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, we're gonna ask for your feedback, um, show your appreciation by filling out our evaluation form, which you can, we will drop right here in the chat again. Um, and then of course, we look forward to seeing you Miami or bust 2022, um, October 17th through 19th. We hope that we will see you there. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day.